Well, as John said, we're on um, webinar five, which seems to have come around uh, really quickly. And uh, the whole um, um, ethos of this uh, trimester is all about recruiting the best. And over the last few weeks, we've talked a lot about uh, building the job description, knowing what we want the job to do, where it's going to fit in the role. We've talked about um, designing the job. And then we moved on and talked about um, how we have the ability to then specify what the ideal candidate looks like. And we've uh, talked in previous webinars um, in this trimester about personality traits, career preferences, looked at general mental ability, uh, verbal, numerical and abstract reasoning, and how these can help us decide what we need, what's our ideal candidate going to look like for the role, for the job that uh, we have that we're, we're dealing with. And last week, John looked at um, how we search for candidates and he used the analogy of fishing to get the person on the hook that we we want. Um, and then how do we reel them in? How do we um, keep them? What, what do we do? What's the whole process? And this week, what we're going to do is take that uh, a step further. We're going to look at the tools that we can use to actually try and help us select the best candidate that we can from the uh, pool of candidates that we get. So wherever we're fishing, we want to get the best. And we need to think about what we're doing when we select a new employee. What is it that we're actually doing? So if you think about it, well, we're trying to predict who's going to excel in the job. And that prediction needs to be done through rational thought, not gut feel. And a couple of webinars ago, um, I talked about that and how we need to be rational about what we're doing rather than actually take a fight or flight um, scenario and, 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 and uh, way forward. Gut feel is not good. We need to base what we're doing on information. And it's important to gather evidence to help us with that decision making. If we go to tribunal for any reason because uh, somebody takes issue with what we've done in the recruitment process, then gut feel is really, really hard to defend at tribunal. But rational argument, that is easier to, to manage and deal with. So how do we do this? Um, let's look at all the tools that we can use to help us with the whole process of selecting the best person. And where we're going to start is looking at the predictive validity of the various tools um, that we can use. You'll see that this, uh, the slide here, it's reproduced in the workbook. So you've got all the information there in your workbook. Um, just looking at the, um, the information there, one positive linear association minus one negative. What that means is we're looking at um, how valid these different things are when we're predicting how well somebody will do. So if we get a figure of, of, of plus one, that means that's a really, really positive um, link between whatever we're looking at and the uh, the validity of that tool. Minus one, on the other hand, that means that that's not a, a good link at all. So have a look at age at the bottom there, minus uh, 0 0.01. That means if we decide that we want to use age to predict how somebody will do in a role, it's not really a very good predictor. Whereas on the other hand, at the top of the slide there, GMA, that's general mental ability, that's got a predictability of 0.58. So a huge uh, difference between looking at things like age, like graphology, handwriting, uh, that's not very good. Some other tools are really good. And what we can do is use a selection of these to actually help us predict as far as we can who is going to be best in the the job that we're, we're interviewing for. And let's just stand this slide for a minute. If we look at unstructured interview compared with structured interview, then you'll see there's a huge difference there in, in how good a predictor a structured interview is. We talk about unstructured interview, that's sitting down, having a chat with the person. You don't really know where you're going. You talk about all sorts of different things. And um, that is not as good as having a, a structure to the interview and being able to then decide, has that person demonstrated what we want them to demonstrate? And we'll talk up more about that as we go through this session. So let's start off looking at GMA. And what, what does that mean? That's general mental ability. And in every job we've got in our organisations, we've got different um, complexions um, in all the jobs. So some jobs will be highly complex. 
some jobs will be quite low in, in the complex nature of their role. Um, let's think about some jobs. Um, maybe a low complex job might be um, something like a, a cleaner, a receptionist. They would not really need um, to, to have high general mental ability for the roles that they're doing. Whereas on the other hand, somebody that perhaps is uh, manipulating numbers, analysing data, they are likely to have a highly complex job. And what we can do, as we discussed in previous webinars, is determine what we need. What level of general mental ability do we need for the role that we're, we're in the job that we're dealing with? And there are three things that we can look at here, and I've got some examples for you. So first is to think about verbal reasoning. And this is all about looking at how good a, a person is when they're um, given some information, some verbal information. They look at it, they decide on what they need to do with it. So here's an example for you. Which of the following is the odd one out? So you can look at that and you might think, yeah, that's that's quite straightforward. Time is the odd one out because all of the others um, are part of time. So hours, months, weeks, they're all um, lengths of time. So quite straightforward. Numerical reasoning. I'll leave you to look at this one just for a minute, see if you can work out which comes next. So don't know whether you got the right answer or not, 60. Um, what we're doing there is adding up the numbers. So 5 and 4 is 9, 23, 37 is 60. So that is a, a, a reasonably simple um, numerical reasoning example. And they can be um, complex or, or fairly straightforward, depending on what it is you're looking for and uh, the level of person that we're trying to um, recruit. Abstract reasoning. Let's give you a minute to look at this one. OK, number four is the answer there. Reason being, just in case you're interested, um, A is to B as C is to number four here. So what we're doing, A and B, um, both of those have got items that go um, horizontal across the page. They're different uh, images in each. If you look at C, you need um, the answer's got to be something that has a similar format to C, but got to be different images. So number one, that has the um, uh, shapes in there. Number two, that's got the line. You'll see that number four is the only one that actually can be the, the viable option there. And GMA tests do have right and wrong answers. And um, they're also timed. So when we use GMA tests, we time individuals, we know that the answers are right or wrong, and we can work out the level of um, mental ability that an individual has. And numerical and verbal reasoning, they can both be learned. Abstract reasoning is a little bit more difficult to learn. It tends to be an innate um, ability. And uh, we've talked about that in the past, and there's uh, quite a bit of information on our website that will uh, be of use to you if you're interested in that. So let's move on to talk about work sample testing. And work sample tests are pretty important because this helps us understand whether or not the person is competent in what we want them to do in the job. So do they have the competencies? Do they have the behaviours that we need uh, for the role, for the job? So let's have a think. Um, we will test for what is important in the role. So. If we've got a job where we want somebody to present information in front of a group, then we need to have something that let, allows us to check that that individual can do what we need them to do. If we want them to um, write, be able to write uh, uh, legibly and give us information, then we need to have a work sample test that will share with us that information. So we might use a test that uh, does several things at once. So let's think about um, a caretaker, for instance. We want to know whether or not they understand how to assess health and safety uh, issues and, and risk assessments around the school. So we might ask them to go and do a work sample test, which is, is going around the school, checking out what issues might be. And we want them to write that down and present that to us so we can check 
whether they're able to maybe fill in forms, whether they're able to actually develop their own way of uh, providing us with that information, as well as checking whether or not they um, understand the risk assessment side of things. Really good example that uh, somebody shared with us quite a, uh, a few years ago now was about a carpet fitter. How on earth can you do some work sample testing for a carpet fitter? You can hardly take them to a client and say, fit that carpet, we'll see how you do. So what this company did, which I thought was quite ingenious, they came up with the idea that if they used um, a small box um, and fitted it with um, a bar down the middle, which uh, effectively would be a room divider bar, they would ask the individual to put in lino on one side, carpet on the other side, fit it into this box. Really, really good idea so they can see how that individual would take on the task of laying a carpet and uh, that, that allowed them to test whether or not that individual could do what they wanted. And when you're doing work sample tests, they don't have to take a long time. The, the task that you set could be 15, 20 minutes. What you've got to do is make sure that it reflects what it is that you want. And very important, um, shown on the slide here, you need to know what you're looking for before you start somebody on the task. And what you need to do is work this out in advance. So you do all of that before you even start the interview process. Work out what it is that's important. What are your criteria for somebody being successful in this role? And you identify all of the criteria that you need to consider. You write them down. You assess against them. And you score against what is relevant. And if somebody demonstrates that they can do it, they get a tick in the box. If they don't demonstrate, mm -hmm. they don't get that tick. And the other thing to be aware of is for work sample testing and actually when uh, the whole interview process, when you're um, interviewing and, and asking questions, don't discuss the scores. Don't discuss scores with other people that are involved in that interview process. Look at the aspect of the job that you are testing. Give your score put it down on paper, that's it, move on. And then when you come to assess people at the end of the process, you tot up all your numbers um, and that gives you the information that you need on how you thought that particular individual did in the recruitment process. And then you can share all the numbers that everybody got. Very, very fair way of doing it uh, and, and completely evidence-based. So work sample tests, really important. And what you do need to do is make sure that it actually is absolutely relevant to the job that you are looking to recruit to. You cannot have a standard work sample test in the organization that you use generically mm -hmm. for every job. It doesn't work. All jobs are different. You need to understand what it is that's important in the job that you're recruiting to and test for that. So, oops. Um, Let's have a look now at um, structured interview. So what's the difference between a structured interview and a non-structured interview? Mentioned earlier on, an, uh, an unstructured interview will be sitting down having a chat. You go all over the place. You don't know what you want as a result of that interview. Um, you just have a chat and it's really nice and you like the person or you don't like the person. Not really a valid way to assess whether somebody is going to be good in the role and is going to meet the criteria that you've laid down. Structured interview starts with the job description. And we talked about this um, a few uh, webinar, uh, webinars ago. You look at the competencies and behaviours that you need in the role and they all come from the job description. And again, in your workbooks, you've got more information on how to look at competencies and behaviours and the able to knowledge about knowledgeable about that you see there. There's more information on that that will be useful to you. You take the job description. You then work out what the questions are that you need to consider and you pull them through into the interview process. So in this example, we've taken a competency from the job description, which you can see there at the top. The requirement is to understand life cycles and um, goes through and gives all the information there that we need as a competence. We then use that to create an activity. And the activity is 
take us through some of the software projects for which you have been responsible. So immediately we're asking them to tell us about what they have done in software projects where they've been responsible. And we ask them to discuss high level concepts of software and we give them the things we want them to talk about. We want them to tell us about life cycles, development approaches, quality approaches and so on. So we're telling them what we want to find out and we're giving them chance then to talk to us about that. And we then pick up all the information that they give us. And what do we do? We use a scoring system. And we know in advance what we're looking for. So we're looking for something on life cycles. They tell us about that. We tick it off. We're looking for development approaches. Have they given us any information that helps us understand that they they have talked about that? They know what we mean. Have they talked about uh, methodologies, methodologies, architecture? We check it all off. We tick for everything we see. And if we don't see it, then obviously we can't give them any points for that. Really, really good way of working it, and it's a clear way of seeing what they are telling us, what competencies and behaviours they can actually share with us. Now, the example here, we've got an activity, take us through what you're doing. You would then, if necessary, ask supplementary questions on that. You don't just ask the one question, you then dig and ask more information as you need to. And that's absolutely fine. The first question for everybody in the interview is the same. And then you will drill down and get the information that you need to be sure that you've got all the information you need that says, yeah, this person has got all the competencies we want. Or actually, I'm really struggling to get an answer that gives us what we need. And sometimes it's really, really difficult because the person just doesn't have the competencies or the behaviours that you want. And you feel like you're pulling teeth trying to give them the opportunity to actually give you the information that you need. But you drill down as far as you need with the questioning to be comfortable that you have got the information that you need. And here are some examples for you of um, work sample tests and, and, and structured interview questions that link back to competencies. So let's take the work sample test first. Um, and this is looking at the um, scenario of perhaps measuring up for a carpet. Measure up, survey and sketch the customer requirement. What competencies are we looking at there? We're looking at being able to listen, being able to analyse, interpret, record client requirements. If we flip to the structured interview side, um, and you'll see there the top one, if you're on a job and a person started talking to you about more work that they wanted to do, what do you think you'd do? The competency there that we're looking at is how proficient is somebody at doing some consultative selling. They're getting information uh, from the uh, client, trying to tease out what they, they might want. Uh, and then you can take it away and say, actually, yeah, we can help you do that. I'll get put you in touch with so-and-so or, or however the best approach is to move that one forward. So some examples there of what a work sample test might look like and what a structured interview might look like. And as I said earlier, please do uh, go through when you're asking the questions, the high level question. If you don't get the answer you want, don't just say, oh, OK, I'm not going to, to continue um, a line of question in there. Dig, get the information that you need. And don't be afraid to actually get go back to the um, a question that, that somebody perhaps hasn't answered properly. Can I just take you back to X, Y, and Z? You said whatever, give me a bit more information on. So make sure that you get all the information you need to, to make an informed decision about whether somebody is or is not able to do what it is you want them to do. Uh, excuse me one minute. Sorry about that. OK, um, next thing, let's talk about psychometric testing. This is another tool that we have in our armory that can help us understand whether somebody is going to match what we want. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is, is personality. Everybody has got uh, a personality. All of us are different. And our personality will either help us or hinder us um, when we've got a, a job to do. And what we need to do is understand whether or not somebody is ideally suited to what it is that we want them to do. 
because if we put somebody in a role and their personality type it, it their traits aren't suited to what we're looking at then actually we're setting them up to fail so in this example here I've picked a G to talk about. So you can see there, G is all about, uh, at one end, being disorganized, um, spontaneous, disregarding rules and obligations. The other end of the spectrum being dependable, dutiful, meticulous, detail conscious. And what we've done there is say, OK, what's our ideal? The black line is our ideal. And then we have two candidates, candidate D, candidate E. And we can see where they sit on the scale and decide how close they match to what we want. So let's think about candidate D, what we can say about them. And you'll see the information here on the slide. They've got a balance between flexibility and conscientiousness uh, and that they're going to respond well to the demands of the work. Candidate E, detail conscious. So you have a look there at the green. You'll see where he sits higher. Uh, he or she sits higher up the, the scale, they're more detail conscious. They believe that everything should be done by the book. What is it that, that we want there? How do we uh, test for that? So we ask a question and the question might be, give me an example of a time when you had to turn a blind eye to something that somebody did or didn't do at work. That can elicit information from somebody about, well, actually, no, we need to do things by the book or, well, actually, I don't mind doing things and cutting corners. Um, you then take that question, ask supplementary questions to get the information that you need to find out whether or not what we're seeing in this profile is correct. And the things that, that I would on this particular profile, I'd be talking to candidate E uh, and asking some questions about beta, the second item on the, the list there which says they're very confident in their own abilities. I'd be asking some questions that, that help me gauge, is that is that really accurate? So we can use this as a tool to make sure that we don't get the wrong individual in a role, uh, because if they're not suited to the role, then they're not going to do very well, and it doesn't work for them, and it certainly doesn't work for us as an organisation. So these um, 16 traits a part of what we call the big five. And we've talked about this in earlier uh, webinars, but here again is just um, the information for you so that you can see the sort of things that we're able to look at and, and tease out about an individual. So we can find out whether or not they uh, are conscientious, whether the conscientiousness of the individual. So have they got very high control over what they're doing? Are they very, very... Um, reserved or are they going to do what we want them to do uh, and will they follow things to the letter or if they've got low control are they a bit less fair about what they do um they're, they're all over the place openness are they very open to new ideas uh would they rather do things that they've always done and we can go through each of these five using that tool and work out having seen the ideal we then work out whether or not the candidates that we're seeing match what it is that we are looking for We've also talked about um, person uh, environment fit, and this is another part of the uh, a tool uh, that we have. We can look at whether or not what we want is um, the individual matches. So in this particular example, we are looking as an ideal, somebody that's uh, very investigative. And the example I'm showing you here, this particular candidate is highly investigative, so they are very likely to, to be able to succeed quite well in that role. So this will help us determine that, yeah, maybe they're going to be uh, suitable for the job that we've got. Shortlisting, let's just go back to, to that. Having looked at the tools that we can use and the questions that, that we can ask, shortlisting is really, really important. We have to make sure that we do this in a, in a, a, a fair and sensible manner. And the best way to do it is again to have the criteria listed so we know exactly what we want and we can mark candidates against it in, in whatever format we want. It may be as simple as ticking that they've got the skill uh, or the, the, the behavior, the competence, whatever it is we're looking at and across if they haven't. In this particular scenario, we've got four candidates uh, here. Candidate D has scored the highest. Question for you. What would you do if you knew that candidate D, actually they've scored the highest there on paper, they're the best, they're really good, but you know that 
they're really not good at what they do. You've you've heard along the rumor mill that that they uh, their performance isn't particularly good. Would you interview them? Well, from my point of view, the answer is yes, you would. On paper, they have come out the highest. They have come out as the best match to what we're looking for. The interview process, using all the tools that we've been talking about, will show you whether or not they actually do match and whether they are indeed the best candidate. And that way you have a, a highly robust system that you can work through and you can justify and evidence why you're making decisions at the end of the process. And just before we finish, I want to touch on assessment centres. Um, if you go back and look in the predictive validity uh, diagram that I showed you, they, they don't come out too highly um, as, as a, a means of actually assessing people. They will use a whole lot of tools um, in an assessment centre day, but what they tend to do is pull everybody together, tends to get used for graduate recruitment, pull all the graduates together, assess them all at once, stick them in the room, ask them to to do a group activity, see who comes out as a team leader, see who doesn't. Um, it's not a, the best way to actually assess people, but it is something that you will see used. And big companies tend to use them um, quite a bit. But you'll see they also use some of the things that, that we've talked about. They use aptitude tests. So they're checking for GMA. They use personality tests. They will use um, interview, um, structured interviews. The case studies in tray exercises, they're doing their, their, their work sample testing. So they do all of these things, but they tend to group a whole load of people together, which doesn't actually work as well as doing um, individual interviews. So we've had a whistle stop tour there uh, on quite a lot of tools that you can use to actually help you de decide who is the best candidate for the job based on your ideal, based on what you understand you want. So we've discussed GMA, personality testing, personal, uh, personal environment fit. We've looked at work sample testing. We've looked at structured interviews. And all of these tools can be used together to, to help you determine who is going to be the best candidate for the role, who most fits and matches the ideal that you've got. And um, it, the more tools you use, the better the predictive validity. But don't make the mistake of thinking you can just add up all the numbers in that um, validity uh, chart. They don't. It doesn't work that way. They don't all add up and, and you get a number that's more than one. They will add together and give you a better validity, but you can't just add them all up. Um, so if we think about our analogy of a needle in a haystack, which John gave us last week, I guess we could say the stronger the magnet, the, the better chance we have of finding that uh, needle. And uh, we're all about finding the needle. We're all about finding the ideal. So on that note, I'm going to hand back to John.